Okay, Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi. Good morning. At least it's morning where I am. Um, this is lecture number 12. We're still on the topic of depositional environments and using Fasi's analysis to interpret depositional environments. Right? So we've looked at uh, continental depositional environments. We look at the second type. Now, of course, the environments. I'm going to break this lecture into several parts, at least three parts, because uh, it's probably one of the most complicated plastic environments to talk about. Okay, so we've learned that um, Plastic depositional environments can be divided into three broad groups, continental, coastal, and marine. Today we're looking at the second type of a mixed marine and non-marine environment, which is the coastal environment. On this uh, block diagram of this block diagram of source to sink concept, we are in the middle, the transition between land and sea. Okay. So the coastal zone is the transition between truly continental and truly marine settings, right? So this is a, an aerial image of the eastern coast of Peninsula Malaysia. It's from Binbax, right? And what you can see here is a river. This is Sungai Pahang. This is the Pahang River. See the back here. And this is a truly continental environment. The fresh water flowing through uh, uh, an alluvial uh, River setting, okay, with flat plains along its side. So this is truly continental, this is alluvial. And then offshore, you have truly marine conditions. This is salt water, you have marine living organisms and marine processing, processes dominating. Right? This is offshore, so this is part of the South China Sea. Now, in the middle here, you have the transition zone, the border, if you like. And you have, uh, you have complex interaction between alluvial processes and also marine processes, which makes the coastal depositional environment one of the most, arguably, one of the most complex uh, environments uh, in classic sedimentology. So what you have here is a beach in the northern area here and also on the southern area. But you have also complex interaction between river and other processes. In the middle here, this is the Pahang Delta. Okay, and somewhere near here is the royal town of Pekan. So, what types of processes influence sediment transport and deposition along the coast? There are three processes that occur here. First, you have rivers just blind sediment from the hinterland to the sea. When we have waves which are pushing this sediment back towards the shore and also moving it sideways along the shore, then you have tides, air pasang surut, which result in also in transport and deposition of sediment along the coast. Uh, these two processes here, waves and tides, these processes can be grouped together as what well to and called marine processes in other. In the previous lecture, we've looked in detail uh, on how sediment is transported and deposited in alluvial depth environments, river environments, and their expression in terms of bed forms and fascias. So the main processes expecting sediment transport and deposition in rivers uh, you know, um, unidirectional, uh, you have unidirectional currents, which are caused by the effect of gravity along a slope, resulting in bed forms such as plain beds, and, uh, unidirectional current ripples, and so on. But you also have another kind of process that we call gravity flows. Gravity flows occur when you have sediment and water mixed together to form a, yeah, a, a dense 
this is your sitting of water, what you call a uh, gravity flow. And this can also move along a slope, moving downwards, down current. And this actually, this flow actually moves below lighter fresh water. But we won't talk too much about gravity flows in this lecture. I'll talk more about gravity flows in the lecture on deep water depth environments where they are more typically found. Today, we just focus on one type of marine process, and these are waves. Everybody has seen waves before, right? Um, uh, um, when you go to the beach, you can see waves approaching the shoreline. Okay, so these are the types of waves we're talking about. And those large waves during the monsoon periods along the east coast, and these are also waves. Okay, So waves are generated over a water surface. And this water surface says usually are really large bodies of water, things like oceans or seas or large lakes. And in these this places, you can get waves generated by wind. They develop as sinusoidal oscillations of the water surface. Right? They form waves, like we've, like we've heard in um, physics. right? And these waves can travel in the direction of the wind and can propagate for thousands of kilometers. And these kinds of long-distance traveling waves are called swells. So because of the interaction between the process of wind and a free surface of water, you start to get waves on its surface. And you can, you can characterize these waves just like you, you, you describe waves in your physics classroom, right? They are electric wavelength, wave height, or amplitude, right? And so on. Okay, so we introduce you to some um, basic terminology. We're going to go back to this, uh, these terms several times during the course. Okay, so several terms you need to know. Things like fetch. Fetch is the distance over which wind acts on the water surface. So you have wind in this case, which is moving from uh, left to right on a very large uh, surface of water. Okay. Now, the distance that the wind acts on the surface water, where it, where it interacts with the surface water and produces waves, this is called the fetch, this distance here. Okay. And these terms already know the wavelength, which can be measured from crest to crest or even trough to trough, the height of the wave, right, from crest to trough, and also the wave period, the time required for one wavelength to pass a fixed point. If you have a fixed point here, let's say this is your point, call it x, and then you propagate a wave from left to right, and once the wave moves a wavelength through that point here, that is called the wave period. But of course, uh, you should know these terms already because this has been repeated since secondary school, also in matriculation, and also in first year undergrad, in all science, uh, science programs at the university. Okay, so these terms, uh, wavelength, wave height, wave periods, describe the wave, okay? And these, these characteristics are controlled by things like the speed of wave, in, in which the wave is traveling, the distance, the wave fetch, and also how long the wave is. is, is moved, right? So this wave duration, all these control these characteristics, how big or small the waves will become. Just an example, this is from Thurman 1988. And you have uh, wave height, wave length, and also wave period plotted against wind speed, kilometers per hour in this case. Okay. And notice uh, the relationship between uh, these 
different character characteristics of a wave and with wind speed. Right? So in the case of height, length, and period, and it's basically we're talking about the size of the wave, they actually increase with wind speed. Okay? So these are important controls. So you have wind interacting with a free surface of water, with a large fetch, and you're starting to get sinusoidal, sinusoidal waves propagating on that surface. And with, you can describe the, the shape of your waves in terms of wavelength, in terms of, uh, in terms of the wave height, and also the wave period. Okay, so now this is a different animation of a wave propagating from left to right on, on the surface of a, a sea in this case. Now imagine if you can actually view a molecule of water moving in this sea and interacting with the waves. So what is the motion of a single molecule of water in these kinds of waves, right? So they form, the motion is called a wave orbital. A single molecule of water moving through a wave follows a circular pathway as it passes a complete wavelength. Okay, so, so a wave travels, starts here and also ends here following a circular pathway. And this pathway is called the wave orbital. So your wave orbital here, you can describe its diameter, and you can also describe the orbital speed. This is the speed of fluid motion about the orbitals, the circular pathway here during the passage of a single wave. Then you can have maximal orbital speed. This is the maximum speed of the water flow. And this occurs beneath the crest and also the trough in opposite directions. Remember this, there are two maximum velocities in the wave orbital. And this occurs uh, at this position when the water molecule is, in the, is just beneath the crest. But then it moves in circular motion and reaches this position here when the trough of the wave passes through. And this is, uh, this is also a maximum speed, but it is now in the opposite direction. Okay, this one is going towards the right, but this one is going towards the left. And you know, there is actually a net, if you look at the net direction, there's actually two net directions, right? You're going first the water the water particles are moving towards the right and then it moves towards the left you can express it as a sinusoidal wave here plotted here on the graph a flow velocity this is time so if you flat if you start with a flat surface of water and then you propagate a wave and your the velocity of the wave or the uh, uh, velocity of the wave will increase until we reach a maximum when the crest passes through the water it decreases again back to the flats uh, yeah decreases again and then moves in the other direction and reaches another maximum velocity here once the trough passes through the water okay, okay. then it, the velocity decreases again and the cycle continues with a new wave passing through the water. Okay, so you have wave orbitals, uh, circular pathways of water molecules moving in the water as waves pass through it. Right now, you actually have um, lots of circular pathways in, in, in the body of water. As we go deeper and deeper, you have lots of cells of wave orbitals. Okay, so what is moving until yeah it's not just at the surface and uh, once you go deeper and deeper you still get the effects of waves so water molecules are still moving in circular 
that's weird. But for orbital diameter of these cells decreases with depth. They become smaller and smaller and smaller as you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And the, also the maximum orbital speed decreases with depth. So the water particles moving are becoming slower and slower and slower as you go further the top of that. So it's the bottom. Now, when you, if you can imagine uh, diving deeper and deeper into a body of water here, you will reach a certain depth where the orbital diameter is too small and the speed of the water molecules is too slow that it becomes negligible. Okay, If you were standing on the sea bottom here below this depth, there will be no movement of the water, or move water, or the water movement will be negligible because of the weight. Okay, so this depth here is called the wave base. Okay, and and the wave base occurs at the depth of half of the wave of this uh, of the wavelength of these waves moving on the surface here. Okay. So at water depths exceeding half a wavelength, so the wavelength is uh, half a wavelength is, is let's say, uh, half a wavelength is up to here. Yeah? Beyond this, there will be no movement of the water. So at depths exceeding the wave base, sediment cannot be moved by the waves. Okay. So that's why most of the time we say, if you see uh, wave, lots of wave deposits, we say that. Uh, these are shallow water deposits because they can only occur at depths um, less than half a wavelength. Okay, they have to be relatively shallow waters. In deeper waters, you don't get any sediment uh, being swept by the waves. Okay? So the wave base is the maximum depth which wave, waves can cause motion. Okay. So in very deep water, right, you have parts of the sea which is below wave base, okay, below half a wavelength. So here, you don't get any sediment being moved. And the only thing, the only deposition that occurs is from um, hemipelagic suspension. You get clay particles at the top here, they sink down, very slowly and accumulate at the bottom, right? Below wave base. But then if you go into shallower waters, so here this is above wave base. Now we can start to see the effect of the relationship uh, of interaction between the waves and sediment at the bottom. Maybe you have sand at the bottom here and can it can be pushed seaward and landward. For numerous cycles to form interesting platforms and sedimentary structures. Yeah. Another thing that happens is that uh, your waves will, will also become more deformed in shallow waters because of less space. So they become flattened, more elliptical in shape, and also more asymmetrical. They, they form open loops, start to move landward now. But we'll talk about that uh, later. In the second part, in the second part, uh, in probably in the third part of this lecture. Now, just as in alluvial uh, processes, uh, the interaction between sediment and waves can also produce platform. Right? These uh, these three dimensional Topography, top, topographies on a bed surface that emerge because of interaction between uh, water movement and the uh, sediment thread. And I've introduced you to the, uh, the concept of, of a bed form stability diagram when looking at alluvial fasces, right? So you have things like uh, you get different kinds of bed forms developing at different velocities. So I need to admit here, so that concept of relationship between bed forms and velocity is simplistic. It's very simple. Right? 
it's actually in reality it's very complicated. It's not just your velocity that controls the development of platforms. It's not just your velocity and green size. Other factors also control the development of platforms. Right? There's one for one thing. There's uh, shear stress. There's a boundary shear stress. Okay? Uh, so here we make make it more complicated. Uh, just a little bit. Right? So for for we've generated that from the past. There are various controls in platform development, right? and this includes things like the orbital velocity. It's, it's just the velocity of the flow, right? And other wave characteristics like wave period, wave length, and orbital diameter. And these characteristics are actually express the size of the waves. If you have uh, a longer wavelength, you have a bigger orbital diameter, you have a longer period, we're talking about larger waves. Um, also, grain size is, is an important character, and also shear stress. Okay. So I'm not going to show you a bad force diagram. I have a more simplistic diagram. Here. This is from this is a summary of Dumas et al.'s work and shows you the relationship um, between what type of bad form that develops and the orbital velocity in centimeters per second. So going from no movement to 120 centimeters per second here. So increasing in velocity as goes to the upwards in this diagram. Okay. Showing you two diagrams here. The green size is the same. This is very fine sand, 0 0.14 millimeter in part. But the difference here is the wave period. This is 10.5 seconds. This is eight seconds. So the size of a wave is different. Okay. But you get a general trend uh, of bed form development with increasing orbital velocity. Right? So you start with no movement of the sediment. And once you exceed this velocity here, the sediment start to develop ripples on its surface, symmetrical ripples. Uh, can be first they are small, then they increase in size, then they change into these bed forms that we call hummocky beds, okay, which occur together with large ripples in this zone here, at least for this green size. And then this changes into plane beds as once you further increase the orbital velocity. So in general, there is a trend of evolving bed forms from symmetrical ripples to hummocky beds to plane beds with increasing velocity and bigger and stronger waves. Right? You change from this to this. But this is a simple story. Just remember, uh, just like we, we, we looked at the bed form diagram for unidirectional currents, the type of bed form that develops is also controlled by grain size. Right? So not all of these bed forms will develop in all grain sizes. For example, if you're dealing with a coarse sand bed, right? you have a deposit of coarse sand bottom, and you increase the velocity gradually, first you'll get symmetrical ripples, but you don't never get any hummocky beds developed because of the grain size. It's, your ripples just become bigger and bigger and bigger. So grain size is very important in the development of what type of bed form that develops. Okay, so let's go have a look at the different types of bed forms here. First, we start with the low energy bed forms, uh, symmetrical ripples. Uh, this is a block diagram of a symmetric bed populated by lots of symmetrical ripples here. This is a cross section, right? This is a, a, this is the top surface expression. So symmetrical ripples have symmetrical profile. You have two slopes, a uh, right-hand slope here and a left-hand slope on this side, and the dip angle will be roughly similar. So they have symmetry. Okay. They tend to have relatively sharp crests. Okay. So I draw it very sharp in this case, knife-like in this case, right? And they, because of the symmetrical profile, 
the break point position is the same as the crest position in the middle here. Right? So it's sharp, like a roof. Right? And in between your crest, you have the low areas here, your troughs, and the troughs are broad and they are rounded. Now, um, spectral ripples have swollen concave upward bases because of, of the circular motion of water molecules. The wavelength ranges from several centimeters to around two meters. So there's a large, uh, there's a large range in terms of sizes of these symmetrical ripples. Okay. Height of symmetrical ripples range between 0 0.5 to around 27 centimeters. Ripple size increases with velocity. You get bigger ripples with faster moving waves. And the grain size ranges from sand to gravel. And if you make a cross section, you get, in, you get uh, internal stratification in the form of cross lamination, just like asymmetrical ripples developed in a unidirectional current field. So here I have a close-up view of the surface. Uh, this, this is a cross-section right, of the surface with symmetrical ripples. All these are symmetrical ripples developed by waves moving at relatively low velocity. So you can describe things like the wavelength from crest to crest or trough to trough. To trough. And this is the crest itself. This is relatively sharp. And the position of the brink is also here. And if you make a cross section, you can see lots of sedimentary features inside it, internal stratification, right? Layers and layers. And the layers have a certain pattern. You can get things like cross lamination, just like you see in, in current uh, ripples, right? But in this case, you can get opposing directions for your cross lamination. These kinds of structures occur because there is a component of lateral migration. There's some sideways movement of the, the symmetric ripples. So they are slightly asymmetric. And there's, a, there's a minor component of current. And notice the swollen concave upward base. Right? It follows the orbital motion of your water molecules. And this is basically because of scour. And then you can have things like chevron upbuilding, you know, alternating laminae. In opposite directions here, right? And this this build up, and also things like bundled up building, like small scale trough cross application in cross section here, right? And these kinds of stratification happen when you have vertical aggregation, meaning that there's a lot of sediment uh, coming into the system, and your layers are building upwards, but still being modified by waves. So there's aggregation or vertical accretion. Okay, this is, this is from, from a classical work from the Raff et al., 1977. Still a good reference. So how do you get symmetrical ripples developing at low velocity uh, orbital movement of water? Right? Low, these are low velocity waves. Okay? So another animation here is just that you are, because of the orbital movement, the circular pathway of your water molecules, you can actually summarize this into two net directions of movement, right? From left to right. It's just left to right movement of water. Make it simple, right? And because of this, you get sweeping of the center at the, at, on the bed, left to right. And first it goes to the right, and then it goes to the left, right? In this area, sweeping. And these cycles of sweeping to the left and right occur maybe for thousands or hundreds of thousands of cycles or millions of cycles every day. We've seen uh, waves operating on um, on a beach, right? And they move very frequently. So this is going to get, these are lots of cycles every day. So because of this, you produce a symmetrical profile to your ripples. So in more detail here, uh, you have uh, you have a wave passing through a body of water, and the water molecules are moving in an orbital pathway, and they are interacting with the sediment along the bed. So what happens um, at maximum orbital velocity in the direction of propagation from left to right in this case? 
a turbulent eddy forms behind the ripple crest here and you get sediment being deposited as a layer. And then you have a reversing flow. So is it, velocity is decreasing here. And it's just, um, the, the flow here, the opposite flow here is sweeping uh, the previously deposited sediment. And the, the sediment is suspended for a short period of time here, suspended momentarily. Okay. Then you get maximum orbital, orbital velocity in the opposite direction. You get deposition along the on the opposite side of the ripple crest, on this side now. And then the cycle continues on and on and on. You get a nice symmetrical profile to your to the ripples, and these can be preserved in the rock rock, rock record if they are buried with more and more sediment on top. Okay. So just to show you some uh, field photos, uh, actual symmetrical ripples. Now, these are modern day symmetrical ripples developing on very fine green sand. This is this is on the beach uh, in Labuan. Okay, this is a modern day. And they occurred, they developed in very shallow waters in, in the intertidal zone here. So this is during low tide. We can we get a glimpse of the surface of this sand bed here. I can see the sharp crests. And oh, I forgot to say. Got to tell you that uh, okay, so you have sharp crests, symmetrical profiles to your symmetrical ripples, right? In plan view, you notice that your your symmetrical ripples tend to have straight crests. They're relatively straight, slightly sinuous, right? And they also tend to bifurcate, superbecabang gitu, separate in, from one into two uh, crests. Uh, these are these are typical characteristics of symmetrical ripples. Okay. Now I'll show you also ancient examples. These are also along the exposed along the coast of Labuan, very near to this exposure here. But so this is a bed of sandstone now, and you can see straight crests and also bifurcating crests here. So these are symmetrical ripples developing on the on the bedding plane of a sandstone which is roughly 20 million years old as you might see this is part of the it should be part of the layang layangan bed or uh, some people also call it uh, equivalent to the maligan formation this is early Miocene. now if you look at it in cross section here now i zoom in to just this part here at a cross section now this is top this is bottom right remember you need to correct this back to paleo to paleo horizontal right so this is this is actually steep almost vertical but uh, remember original horizontal original horizontality this bed was once horizontal 20 million years ago it has been tilted by tectonics now if you make a cross section i've now uh, i've now made it Back to paleo horizontal here, made it back to paleo horizontal. You can actually see the symmetrical profile of two ripples here with a sharp crest. So these are symmetrical ripples, and we can make the interpretation that they were made by waves operating on a shallow sea 20 million years ago in Labuan. Now these are also symmetrical ripples you know, by waves, but these are larger. That's one ripple crest, that's one ripple crest. And in this case, the wavelength is more than one meter. It's a really large. Yeah? So that's person for scale, one of my undergrads said before. And you can see that's one wavelength. Yeah? So these are large. You can see the undulating surface. Not that, not that, not that great a photo, but this is much better. You can actually see the straight crests of these very large wave ripples and superimpose on these large ripples here you can also get smaller symmetrical ripples also developed by lower velocity waves and this is from uh, an exposure in Perlis this is part of the Kuban Pass formation this is Permian in age okay so this is the same exposure again in 
the Kubang Pass Information in Perlis. We did a uh, well. I was satisfied with the study, and we did we did an okay study on this surface with large ripples. And uh, uh, what we did is we took lots of pictures and made a three D photogram photogrammetry model on the computer. Right, so discarded away with all the colors here and just look at the surface here. And that scale is two meters, which is the same exposure, remember? Now you can clearly see the relatively straight crashes of those symmetric ripples. We have symmetric in profile, and some of them are bifurcating into two to even four uh, crashes. Right? These have wavelengths of more than one meter. Now remember, Green size also affects the type of platforms that develop. At these large wavelengths, if these were developed uh, by really large waves during storms, basically, must yeah, reboot. Okay, so in, if this was these were fine grain deposits, you should have developed hummocky beds. But here, you don't develop hummocky beds, but your ripples just grow larger and larger and larger with increasing orbital velocity because of the coarser grain size. If you make a thin section of this bed, uh, of rocks from this bed, you notice that you have large grains of fossils, crinoid ossicles, fossil forams, and they have these forams have diameters more than one centimeter long. So these are up to granule size or even pebble size. So you get large ripples rather than hummocky beds. So let's look at the next type of uh, bed form that, that can develop. If you further increase the orbital velocity, you get larger waves, maybe you're going into a storm now, not quiet water anymore, and not fair weather anymore, but storm weather, you will develop hummocky beds. As in symmetrical ripples, if you make a cross section of a hummocky bed, it will also have a symmetrical profile. Okay. But the crest is no longer sharp, sharp. They have rounded crests and they are broad. Okay. And they are three dimensional bed forms. They don't have a straight crest right, to a simple profile. They dip at different directions okay, to form a mound. And these are called hummocks. They form convex upward surfaces. And in between the convex upward surfaces, you have lower areas. And these are called the swales. And they form concave surfaces. So you have these 3D dome-shaped bed forms here. These are your hummocks with various dip directions with swales in between. These are relatively large bed forms. They have a wavelength ranging from 1.5 to 3 meters with heights between 10 to 25 centimeters. And they only occur in grain sizes ranging from very fine to fine grain sand. Dealing with coarser grain sand, you will not get any hummocky beds developing even though you increase the orbital velocity. Okay. So if you make a cross section of a hummocky bed and look inside it, you can see internal stratification also. But this is in the form of what we call hummocky cross stratification, abbreviated to ACS. Okay. So ACS tends to form laminae, and they are roughly parallel to bedding, but they are undulating. They go up and down following the shape of your hummocks and swale. Okay. So you have undulating lamination, and in places, they form cross stratification, there's cross bedding. Where you have, let's say, here you have laminate undulating, goes upwards, and then you, it becomes truncated by the uh, by, by another bed at the top here, and the truncation here and the cross stratification that develops is less than ten degrees, very low angle cross bedding. So this is not your steep cross bedding that you see in current ripples or cross beds, right? These are much gentler, less than ten degrees. So you have undulating lamination, and the, the lamination can also become convex upwards when they are associated with hummocks. Okay, so this hummocky cross stratification. 
example in the field of hummocky cross certification. This is fine grain sandstone, and this is also from Malaysia. Yeah? You don't have to go far to look at these, these types of uh, platforms. This is part of the Kaling Formation. And exposed in Kuala Lipis in Pahang. Okay? And these are Paleozoic in age. Yeah? Wait, might be uh, Triassic, I can't remember. But get back to you in Spectrum if you want. Yeah. But yeah, if you want, you can Google uh, Kaling Formation if you can't wait and yeah? try to find out what's the age. But these are old rocks, yeah? the sandstones. And notice here you have uh, lamination, the bed centimeters are left. Huh? So they have been you have, the beds are tilted, remember that. But you have lamination here. In some cases, it goes upwards into a hummock shape, right? It's convex upwards. In some case, other cases, it is uh, concave upwards right? when you go through the swales. You also get evidence for low angle cross stratification here, where the low beds here. Are much straighter and then they are cut by an overlying lamin lamin lamina here. So this is low angle cross stratification. So this is hummocky cross stratification. So in the Kaling formation during the during ancient times, there were storms, waves big enough to develop hummocky bed. Right? All this was underwater millions of years ago. In Kuala Lipis. Another example here, uh, going back to that outcrop in Perlis. Uh, this is Bukit Tengkulumbu, uh, part of the Kubang Pass Formation. I forgot that uh, uh, members of this class here at UM, you've gone to this uh, to this exposure, this is outcrop, and you know it well because you've logged it, right? So so show you some details here in terms of sedimentary structures and that form. So these are several beds, pencil for scale on the side here, 13 centimeters approximately. And these sandstone beds here, right? And you, I make a sketch to make it much clearer. You actually see undulating lamination, hummocky geometries here, and then low angle cross stratification here, right? On this bed here, in fine grain sandstone. So this is hummocky beds, and these were developed by storms. But you also have smaller ripples with a swollen base, symmetrical profile, and with a relatively sharp crest. So these are symmetrical ripples which develop um, during, you know, quieter times in between the storms, right? So you get lower velocity bed forms, you know, maybe smaller ripples, symmetrical ripples. So you have interbedded hummocky beds and symmetrical ripples. And because of the high energy flow, you also get lots of shell fragments, which were transported by the really large storms, right? Okay, so you have symmetrical ripples developed at lower orbital velocities. You increase uh, the orbital velocity. You have larger waves. Uh, you get hummocky beds. They further increase the velocity. You get this type of bed form. Uh, plane beds. These are flat beds. Uh, you've seen this uh, now. If you remember the, the lecture on unidirectional currents, you, you remember the bed possibility diagram. You say, wait a minute. I've seen this bed form before, right? If you have high velocity flow in a unidirectional current in a river, you also get plain beds. Eh? Your dunes will change it to plain beds. So in terms of uh, characteristics, this is very similar to unidirectional plain beds. Okay? They have grain sizes ranging from very fine sand to maybe gravel. And in terms of internal stratification, you have horizontal lamination, which are parallel to the bed, right? That's horizontal emission. So there's not much studies in terms of um, plain beds that develop in in wave dominant environments, at least uh, studies known to me, lah, right? Uh, but it seems that it's not easy to differentiate between these kinds of plain beds with unidirectional current plain beds. So let's just leave it at that in this lecture. So this is the final slide in, in today's lecture. So as a summary, yeah. so we, we, look, we looked at um, how wind operating on the surface of water, which is very large, you have a large patch, results in the formation of waves on its surface, which propagate in a certain direction. 
And if you have shallow enough water above wave base, above half a wavelength, you start getting interaction between uh, the circular pathways of moving water in your sea with sediment along the sea water. And you start to get interesting uh, bed forms uh, developing depending on the uh, depending on lots of characteristics such as uh, orbital velocity, uh, the wavelength, the wave period, shear stress, and so on. Okay, so if you look at enough outcrops throughout the world, right, you start to see a pattern, uh, a pattern of, bed, uh, of sedimentary structures that develop in single beds that occur in wave and storm dominated environments. We get this kind of pattern here. Uh, let's just focus on the top part here. You have a sandstone and it will be sharp base with an irregular base here. It goes up and down because of the erosion. Then you have uh, plain beds at the bottom which are overlaid by hummocky beds followed by symmetrical ripples at the top. And then it is overlaid by mudstone at the top. Okay. So if you want to talk about it in terms of sedimentary structures and fasces, uh, sedimentary structures are going from horizontal lamination, grading upwards into hummocky cross-certification, grading upwards into ripples with cross-lamination, right? And remember, when we talk about bed forms here, we're talking about, we can talk about them in terms of fasces. You can say that plain beds are one fasces. You can say that hummocky cross-certified sandstone is another fasces, symmetrical ripple sandstone is another fasces. If you want to look at details. But also remember, you can also lump them together as a single bed, as a single fasces, depending on the kind of study you're doing whether it's large scale or small scale. Right? As fascist analysis is a method, it is independent of scale. Right? So you tend to get these kinds of sections, sections here, which are normal graded. Right? And you can easily interpret this in terms of decreasing velocity. Right? So from plain bed, uh, first you had seabed erosion at very high velocities, uh, all sediments, were transported, you only had erosion. There was a soft mud substrate at the bottom of the seafloor here, and it is being eroded by your really large, really strong storm, so at the reboot. Then the flow velocity starts to wane, decreasing in velocity, you start to get plain beds develop once you have deposition starting. And then further reduce the velocity, decrease the velocity, hummocky beds start to develop and when you further decrease the velocity your your velocity is very slow now you start to get smaller bed forms developing on top which might even be finer green you get symmetrical ripples but then your storm stops you go back to normal conditions fair weather conditions uh, sand is no longer being deposited and what happens is that you only get hemipelagic suspension falling down from the water column in the form of clay. You get a hemiplegic mudstone deposited on the top. So this normal graded bed here, we call it a tempestite. And this is a storm deposit, right? So you get this predictable vertical fascist change in storm bed. So you find these kinds of beds in an exposure, you can imagine that they were, they were deposited by a single storm. Maybe there was, there was a monsoon season that you see along the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia. You have really large, large waves developing, right? And they're interacting with sediment at the bottom, and you get this kind, you get this kind of succession. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, the next lecture we'll talk about another marine process. Uh, those are tides. Okay, so again, uh, stay safe, stay at home uh, during this. Uh, movement control order in Malaysia up to 14th April. Okay, and you can look at that. The other, like, yeah, if you have nothing else to do, you can uh, revise uh, the all also the other lectures. Yeah, I'll put more and more lectures uh, until we start again uh, class in on the 27th. Okay, so see you again. Bye bye.